In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I start off this lecture by saying last week, but not last week. Last week, we did not talk about the person and work of Jesus Christ, because I wasn't here. But I recorded it. It's online. So if you haven't watched it yet, look for it. Uh, Catechism 4 is up, um, and it's a little bit shorter than the other ones. Um, in that talk, uh, I mentioned a quote from Father James Bernstein. There's a really great book. It's not on the catechumen list. Uh, however, it's one that I do recommend. It's called Surprised by Christ by Father James Bernstein. Um, really f just fantastic book. I think you can also get it on Audible. Um, and in this, he has a section where he talks about the threefold barrier uh, between God and man and how Jesus' person and work healed and, and cured these barriers. So the three barriers were the barrier between the uncreated and the created, the barrier of sin, and the barrier of death. These are the three things that keep us separated from God. And if God is the fulfillment of our deepest yearnings and longings, unless we overcome those three barriers, we can't fulfill our deepest longings and yearnings, which means we're always going to be fragmented human beings. So how did Christ overcome these barriers? The barrier between the uncreated and the created was bridged in the incarnation because in the very person of Christ, this is mainly what the last lecture was about, you have someone who is fully God and fully human in one person. So the divine, the human, the uncreated, the created are together in one person. The barrier of sin was overcome in the cross. And I gave a quote from St. John Chrysostom where he talks about how death is the consequence of sin. And so when sin claimed Christ, even though Christ had never sinned, or death claimed Christ, even though Christ had never sinned, uh, sinned, sin acted unjustly, and therefore it condemned itself. So sin was condemned upon the cross. And then, of course, in the resurrection, Christ shows himself to have power over death, even to be life itself. Christ himself is life, and so death has no power over him. So those three barriers between the uncreated and the created, the barrier of sin and the barrier of death, are overcome in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, the, the, the obvious question after this is, if Christ of overcomes those things in himself, how can we overcome those things in ourselves? And that's what we're going to talk about today and next week. So, for the next two weeks, we'll discuss how we make Christ's victories our victories. The spiritual life lives on a knife's edge. What's on the two sides of this edge? One side is hopelessness. Okay, hopelessness that says, I can do nothing for my salvation. I, I'm so full of sin. How could I ever be saved? And then on the other side, there's dangerous presumption. Well, Christ is merciful, so I really don't have anything to worry about. I could just be fine. We really need to find this, this, this balance between the two of these. We have to find this ba balance between living as citizens of heaven while still existing on this earth, between focusing on our sins and the fact that we are such sinners, but also on the fact that Christ really does care for us and seeks our salvation. There's this knife's edge that we're always balancing on. Now, orthodoxy is full of paradox and balance. We've talked a lot about this already. There's so much paradox in orthodoxy. It's not contradiction, it's paradox. It's a both and always. The most foundational balance that we seek in the Christian life is in Greek called synergia, or simply in English, synergy. Synergy. And synergy simply means a meeting of the efforts of God and the efforts of man. Okay? So what we're going to do for the next two lectures is talk about both of these. Today we'll talk mainly about the efforts of man, and next week we'll talk mainly about the efforts of God. And then we'll talk about how these two things come together. And again, the theme here is we're always on a knife's edge. There's always balance. You have to do something, but you can't rely on yourself. You have to rely on God, but it doesn't mean you can do nothing. <laughs> there has to be this balance between the two. To fall into either extreme, to go just one way or just the other way, means you're going to fall into heresy. And remember how we talked about heresy, different beliefs? A wrong belief will lead you to a wrong approach, which will be bad medicine. It won't be salvific. So what are the two, what are the two uh, false beliefs? What are the two heresies that we're trying to avoid in this? Well, if you focus only on the idea that all of salvation is relies in God, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can say, this is all about God and only God, then you fall into what we know as Calvinism. And Calvinism, or what's called double predestination, it's the idea that God predestines those who will be saved and those who will be condemned. 
God has already decided that there are certain people who are going to be condemned and go to hell, and that's just, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing they can say or do that will ever change this. They're going to hell. They were created in order to go to hell. Okay, well, the scriptures challenge this, don't they? And the main scripture that challenges this is 1 Timothy 2.4. There's many others we could talk about, but that's the main one. This is the verse that tells us that God, quote, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How can Christ desire that people be saved and predestine them for hell at the same time? It doesn't work. But if you fall to the other side, you fall into a lesser known heresy. There's a heresy maybe you haven't heard of called Pelagianism. Pelagius was a, was a monk uh, in the, I think, the 4th century, if I remember right. I could be wrong about that. And he had the idea that because man was created by God and still has the image of God, even if not fully intact within him, that man by his own efforts, without the aid of grace, can find salvation. Man can be saved by his own efforts. And this is challenged by Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. And again, we could add many, many verses to this, but Pelagian was condemned by uh, first by St. Augustine. Now, he went a little bit too far with some of it. And then by later father, St. John Cashin is the one who offers the greatest balance to some of this. I'll talk about that in just a second. So, again, there's no single verse that encompasses all of salvation. When you ask somebody, a Christian, what salvation is, and they give you one verse and only one verse, you have to understand, that verse is placed in the context of the entirety of scriptures for a reason. And if you noticed, the scriptures aren't very systematic. You ever notice that you can't look at the table of contents in the scriptures and say, I want all the verses about this, and they all come in one place? You have to look to multiple places, and they need interpretation. Why? This goes all the way back to the very first lecture. Because Christ didn't give us a system of belief, he gave us a way. And that way is through relationship with him. Can you take your relationship with a spouse or with a sibling, or with a parent, and write a book where everything is delineated perfectly in different categories, and you write it, and someone can read that and say, now I fully understand your relationship? No way! There's going to be a great mystery. With our relationship with God, we want the mystery of it. We want to keep growing. We want to keep delving deeper into that mystery and never feel satiated. We want the mystery of salvation to grow continually for all eternity. And so Christ says, here, this will help you to understand what the relationship with me looks like. Now work. And in that relationship, you're going to see that it ever expands. And the more it expands, the different, more, uh, more ways you interpret those very scriptures to begin with. This is why we read the scriptures, the same gospels, over and over and over again. Throughout your whole life, you'll read into deeper and deeper and greater mysteries. St. Seraphim of Sarab, who spent many years as a hermit deep in the forest, he would read the entire New Testament every single week. All the way through, the entire New Testament. There's a, there's a book called The Little Russian Philokalia, and it talks about St. Seraphim. There's one volume, I think it may be volume one, I'm not sure. It's on St. Seraphim of Sarov, and you can find in there what his, his uh, scripture reading rule was. You know, M Monday, the Gospel of Matthew, Tuesday, the Gospel of Mark, and so on and so forth. And it goes through the entire New Testament in one week. He never got tired of doing this. And there are saints who had the scriptures memorized and would continue to read them because the depth never ends. <laughs> so you'll, you're never going to find one verse, one verse that tells you the entirety of salvation. If I had to, though, if someone really pushed me and said, explain the orthodox concept of salvation, my answer would be simple. By grace, you have been saved through faith. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Now, here's the problem. We have to define grace. We have to define saved. We have to define faith. And all those different definitions mean that we will interpret this verse differently, depending on how we, how we uh, describe these things. So, what happened with Pelagian? I want to, because, again, I think we're more familiar with the Protestant Reformation and Calvin. I want to tell you a little bit more about Pelagius. Pelagius, not Pelagian. Pelagius. So, in the history of, of the church, Pelagianism was the main fight that caused the clarification in the theology of faith and works. St. Augustine was the main opponent of Pelagius, but what happened is, is that when St. Augustine wrote against Pelagius and wrote against the idea that man can be saved by his own works without grace, he ended up going a little bit too far the other way. And he planted some seeds that people see Calvinism in. Now, if you were to push him on these things, would he have said that? Would he have, said, would he have believed in double predestination? I don't really think so, as someone who's read quite a bit of St. Augustine. However, 
He was trying to push so much, and you see this in the history of the church when they fight against heresy. Sometimes they overemphasize the other aspect in order to really show that this is wrong. St. Augustine went a little bit too far, and really it's his disciples who he said, Augustine is the be-all and end-all for everything. And that really wasn't the case. So there was a monk named St. John Cashin. St. John Cashin, there are two works that come down to us from St. John Cashin. Uh, one is called The Institutes. We'll actually talk about that in a minute. And one's called The Conferences. The Conferences is a thick book. And in The Conferences, St. John Cashin travels to all the famous desert monasteries and all these hermitages. And he talks with many famous abbas, these great spirit-bearing elders of the desert. And he has different conversations about various things. In Conference 13, he talks about the subject of grace and free will. And in this, he discusses the concept of synergy. What's interesting is when I first read this, I was really frustrated by Conference 13. And the reason I was frustrated is because I wanted an equation. As a good Western Christian, I wanted a simple equation. This plus this equals this. And it's just that simple. But instead what he does is he takes various scriptural stories and various uh, verses and he combines them together to show that salvation is a working together of man's will and God's will. So it's not systematic theology, but it shows that in relationship, there's a mystery to this, but there are certain principles that are true. It's not just one or just the other. And it's a really beautiful thing to read. Um, if you want, you can find a uh, kind of archaic translation of it online. It's pretty easy to find. Um, but uh, there's a series called Ancient Christian Writers that did a, a very good translation of it. You can get it on a hard copy or through Kindle. Um, but again, it's a, it's a beast. It's a th really thick book. Uh, St. John Cashin, um, uh, is commemorated on February 29th, and if there is no February 29th, it's February 28th. Um, and he's very beloved in the church. What's interesting is in the West, in Roman Catholicism, they uh, they had such a love for St. Augustine, he, he never actually named St. Augustine. He never puts his name. He had a great reverence for him, and so he didn't want to condemn him by name. He just said, ah, you don't want to say this, it goes a little too far, this is the proper theology. And that's what he says. But Many people recognized that he was talking about St. Augustine. And so the West said, well, John Cashin, he's, he's actually a semi-Pelagius. They came up with this, this language like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. And so he's not a saint for the, the Roman Catholics. However, here's the really strange part. His relics are in Italy at a Roman Catholic monastery where they venerate him every single year on his feast day. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a confusion in, in Roman Catholicism whether they venerate him as a saint or not. For us, there's no question. St. John Cashin is a saint. Um, and, and an incredible one at that. So, how do we understand this idea that the efforts of God and the efforts of man must meet? Um, just like we talked about um, in Lecture 4 about salvation and how there really is no single paradigm that will explain this, because this is a relationship, there's really no single paradigm that will explain it all that well. However, years ago I came up with an analogy that I, I may have already used in the Catechism, um, and if I did, forgive me, I'm going to give it again, that I think begins to explain kind of how grace and the efforts of man work together. Ironically, I'll take a sip from my cup, and I'm going to use a cup as an analogy. I won't use this one, though. So, imagine that I have a glass in my hand. This glass represents the heart of man. And I remember we talked about the heart of man. What's the heart of man full of? All dragons, all evil, all wild beasts, all demons, all vet passions, but also all virtues and heaven and all the angels. and all, It's all good and all evil can be in the heart of man. Read the scriptures. You're going to find verses that talk about how beautiful the heart is, how deceptive the heart of man is, because both are in there. And this is, the, this is the fight. The fight is for the heart of man. So what do we want from this glass? <laughs> Remember when Christ is talking to the Samaritan woman, who we know to be St. Fotini, and he, he's, he, says, uh, he says he wants a drink of water, and he tells her, I'll offer you some water, which if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. And she says, give me some of this water. This is, the, this is what we want in our glass. That water is grace. We want our glass so filled with grace that grace will quench our thirst for, again, the deepest longings of man, that fragmentation will be made whole. This is what we want, is our glass to be filled with this life-giving water, which if we drink of, we'll never thirst again. The problem is there's no room in this glass. There's no room. Our glass is already full. And what's it full of? It's full of dirt. And dirt is to represent the sins of man. And most sin, basically all sin, comes from one place, egoism. Egoism, the place that says, what I want is the most important thing, okay? If I'm impatient in line, I don't have time for this. My time is more important than this, egoism. 
Somebody cuts me off. How dare they? They uh, egoism. Someone gossips about you. How dare they say that about me? Well, I'm going to spread rumors about them. Egoism. Sloth. No, I don't want to say my prayers. You know, I, I'm tired. And getting rest from my body is more important than me worshiping God. Egoism. Again and again and again. Egoism is really the trap for us. And that's mainly what this dirt is made of. The other problem with this dirt is that some of this has been really impacted in and it's become calcified. It's really in there. So what do we need to do to get our glass full of water? You need to do two things. You need to scoop the dirt out, pour the water in. Okay? What's happening here? As we scoop the dirt out, what we're doing is trying to get rid of those passions that are deep within us. We're trying to say no to our own egoism. We ha that's a tough thing to do, but we have to make efforts. It's not just going to happen on its own. Nobody becomes a Christian and just notices, oh, all my egoism is gone and I'm perfectly humble now. It doesn't happen. You see this in the scriptures in St. Paul's writings. He's constantly reminding Christians of what life they were called to. Why? Because it doesn't just go away on its own. So what do we do? We practice works of selflessness. In other words, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So how do we deny ourselves? Well, every time we notice that egoism coming up, we say no and we practice the corresponding virtue instead. But also there's some general things that the church gives us. It says The church says pray, have a morning and evening prayer roll, go through long vigils, listen to long boring talks by priests. This will really get out the egoism. All of you want to be watching like Maverick right now, right? Not this. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what other movies are out. Um, <laughs> We fast. We come to services. We stand through the services. Like all this is saying no to the comfort of our body, no to that egoism all the time. So we scoop out the dirt. But if we scoop out the dirt, are we now saved? Can you go out to the desert with that glass and be saved? No, there's nothing to drink. So what do we need to do? We need to come to the hospital for the sickness of sin where the medicines are poured out. And through everything the church does, through the prayers, through the services, Mainly through confession and communion, water is poured in. This fills us with grace. Grace saves. So what are we doing here? You're saved by grace through faith. Faith is, faith is actively living out. It's actively living out the gospel of the Lord. This is really what faith is. And as we scoop out the dirt, we come to Christ, he pours the water in. And what's a saint? A saint is one who has poured, who's scooped out so much dirt that all there is is water, and that water overflows to the entire world. This is how the efforts of man and the efforts of God work together. Again, is it more complex than that? Of course it's more complex than that. But this is just an image to kind of help explain. When somebody looks at the Orthodox Church and says, you believe you're saved through your works, we go, no, I believe my works make room in my heart so that grace can actually come inside of me. This is why Christ says you can't serve God and mammon. What is serving God and mammon? Mammon is not just money, it's egoism. So he's saying you can't pour water and dirt in at the same time. Eventually the whole glass is going to be filled and that water is just going to spill out. You can't serve both. You have to decide, am I going to serve God or am I going to serve myself and my own egoism? Okay, there's a lot more that we could say about this, but we don't have the time to go through everything. So when, when we talk about this, a lot of times people will say, I don't know how you could even preach this because St. Paul clearly condemns works. So read Romans. He condemns works all over the place. Interestingly enough, he also says that we'll be judged for our works in Romans. And so how do we reconcile these things? Well, we have to understand that when St. Paul is writing against works, he's specifically writing against works of the law. He's trying to tell the, the Christians as Judaizers are going. Judaizers were the ones who were saying, yes, Christ is the Messiah, but you need to continue to do all the works of the law. And he was saying, no, Christ came to fulfill the law. We, these works aren't going to save you. That's not what the law was for. And what's the main law? What's the main work of the law that he's talking about? What's the main one? Circumcision. Circumc he's saying, just because you're circumcised doesn't somehow make you saved. That's what he's mainly talking about. So if you read St. Paul holistically and put everything in context, you realize there's nowhere where he's saying, don't struggle to live a moral life. If you don't believe me, go read Galatians, I think, 5. 4 or 5. I think it's Galatians 5. And he constantly says, he's, he's talking about how there's freedom in the gospel, but freedom doesn't mean you can go do whatever you want. And he says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> well, I thought I was free, and I didn't have to worry about any works of righteousness. Well, no, but you, it doesn't mean, you, you can't serve sin and serve God at the same time. That's not the way it works. If you want to go into a deep dive on this topic, there's a talk that I gave that's on, on uh, YouTube, um, 
called uh, uh, Freedom and Obedience to the Gospel. And listen to that, and you'll, you'll see kind of how these things interplay. So, again, in Romans 2.6, it's in Romans that St. Paul says, For he will render to every man according to his works. That's in Romans. It's in Romans. So, how we live is not just a sign of the grace that's in us. Yes, it's a sign of the grace that's in us. But it also is how we continue to gain more grace within us. We live out these virtues hoping, begging Christ, that he'll help us in this process. By the way, even that scooping out of the dirt, we need Christ for. So Christ is involved in every aspect of this. You can't breathe if it weren't for Christ. So Christ is involved in every aspect. But again, you're working with him. We have to work with him. We see this especially in the book of James, the epistle of James. St. James, uh, interestingly enough, when Luther first began kind of leading the Reformation, and he was pushing this, this new interpretation of Paul and of the gospel, he read James, and you know what he said? This isn't the gospel. So what are we going to do with James? We'll just get rid of it. We're just going to throw it out. And then some of his disciples said, not a good idea. <laughs> Don't do that. And so he said, okay, okay, we'll leave it in there, but we've got to reinterpret it. We've got to interpret it so it fits what, what really what I think Paul is saying. That's really what happened. So he eventually left James in there, but he didn't like it. So James 2, verses 14 to 26. What does it profit, my brethren, if a man say he has faith, but has not works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Just believing in God isn't enough, the demons believe. Do you want to be shown, you foolish fellow, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Adam believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. One other interesting note about Luther, he added the word alone. He, he actually altered the scriptures. He added the word alone to Romans. So one is saved by faith alone. And I've, I've heard modern Lutheran scholars justify this and say, well, he's just putting what is clearly implied in the text. That's, that's really all he's doing. The irony of this is that the, there's only one place in the entirety of the scriptures where the words faith and alone come together. And it's what we just read when St. James says, one is not faith, is saved by faith alone. It's the only place in all of scriptures where you find those two words together. It's interesting. So we read this very much in light of the fight between Roman Catholics and Protestants in the Reformation. But th this is not a fight the Orthodox Church ever really had. We never really had this, this fight. There was no Reformation for the Orthodox. Now, eventually there were some discussions between the Lutherans and Constantinople. And you can read these. Uh, these are, are translated in English. But the reality is, is the Reformation was something exclusively happening in the West. For the Orthodox Church, we understand that faith is not a static thing. It's not a simple yes or no. Faith is living and active. Faith is living and active. It's not a simple yes or no proposition. This means that faith lies on a spectrum. Faith can be great. Faith can be small. All of the scriptures talk about this, by the way. Right? What does Christ say? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can do what? Say to this mountain, be picked up and thrown to the sea. Okay, well, let's test to see how much faith I have. Horrible Starbucks cup. Be lifted out of my hand and thrown over there. My faith isn't even the size of a mustard seed. So what do I need to do? I need to continue to work in order to grow my faith. I need to work to get my heart cleansed and purified 
and emptied, so there's room for grace, so Christ can give me true faith. This is why I always tell people that orthodoxy is about faith seeking faith. It's imperfect faith seeking perfect faith. So faith can be great or small. Works, as I said, are both the fruit and the fuel of faith. The more we pray and fast, the more we trust in God. The more we trust in God, the more we want to pray and fast. This means that faith can often be read, really in the scriptures, as faithfulness. A lot of times when we see the word faith, the proper interpretation, the proper translation is faithfulness. It's faithfulness to Christ that we seek. There's an Anglican bishop and theologian, uh, I really admire a lot of his works, N.T. Wright. Now remember, Anglican, he's Protestant. And what does he say? He says most often when St. Paul writes the word faith, the word he would actually translate it as is allegiance to Christ. Allegiance to Christ, really interesting. In other words, faith can be seen. Faith can be seen in how we live and how we function with one another. Now, as I said, the scripture in the scriptures, the heart is described as both the seat of corruption and sin and the place where the kingdom is. And there's a war happening within us. So what, what role does the ego play in this? Well, the, the sin feeds the ego. Sin tells the ego that, that we can really do things ourselves. We don't really need grace. We can be fulfilled without God. Think back to talk number two. Remember, we're fragmented within us. There's, there's fragments within us. There's fragmentation within us. And the noose, the focus of the soul, is constantly scattered, going from place to place. And being scattered, it's never fulfilled. It never finds any place to sit and rest and actually find fulfillment. And so it goes to one thing and says, I think this will fill me. And then it goes, oh, actually, this disappointed me. And then it goes to the next thing, I think this will fill me. No, it actually disappointed me. I'll go to this thing. No, that actually disappointed me. And so what do we need to do? It's the ego that's saying this. It's the ego saying, I can be fulfilled without God. Whose sin was that? Adam and Eve. Every time we sin, we're reliving the sin of Adam and Eve. We're saying, I can find fulfillment for my fragmentation and my emptiness, but apart from God without obedience to God. What I can do is feed the ego and somehow I'm still going to be okay. And so what do we have to do? We have to drive the ego out and crush it. Crush it. You may say, Father Paul, come on, that's really violent language. Why would you use that? The gospel is about peace. It's not about violence. I don't know because I heard someone say that the kingdom of, of uh, heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It's in a really famous book. It's a really famous person who said that. This is why violence takes the kingdom. We need violence in the spiritual life, the violence within our heart. So when we talk about asceticism, these are the efforts of man. It's in one word, asceticism. That's the efforts of man. Do we find asceticism in the scriptures? Well, what's the best definition for asceticism there is? Matthew 16, 24 to 25. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm sorry to say, again, this is an overgeneralization, this is not true everywhere, but I'm sorry to say that much of Western Christianity has lost asceticism. Christianity has been over-intellectualized. There have been extreme misunderstandings of scriptures because of this. And a lot of people live their Christianity without losing their life for Christ, without trying to drive out without trying to deny themselves and drive out and crush the ego. But if there's no asceticism, according to these verses, we're not following Christ, which means there's no Christianity. There's no such thing as non-ascetic Christianity. It's just no such thing. Sorry. It doesn't exist. What we're called to in the scriptures is to live as citizens of heaven. And like with so much of the scriptures, this has to be properly interpreted. And we have to understand that this means that you cannot poeticize this language and say, this doesn't really mean anything for me. No, this has practical implications for us. It has practical impl implications. Christ quite literally defines the Christian life as a path of self-denial and the cross. This also means, by the way, that anybody who tells you that the more faith you have, the better your life will be, the wealthier you'll be, the more riches you'll have, is wrong. I won't mention anybody by name, but there's somebody down in Texas with a big phony smile, <laughs> forgive me, who writes a lot of very well-selling books, and I would not recommend reading him. 
This also means something else. It means that asceticism, and this Orthodox Christians need to take up and understand, asceticism is not only for monastics. It is not only for monastics. Remember, monasticism, we haven't talked about this yet, but monasticism was a response to Christians who said, the seriousness of the church is falling away because the church has been legalized. Before, it was people who were willing to die at any moment for their faith. Now, everyone's coming in, so we're going to run out into the desert. And we're going to live this, not in a more extreme way, but in the way that the church has lived it for 300 years. We don't want it to be watered down. This is why monasticism is a light for us, the lay people. In fact, St. John Chrysostom says there's only one difference between married and monastics. Virginity. He says that's the only difference. Monastics remain virgins. Those who are married don't. But in everything else, we should, be, we should be alike. Now, obviously, we have to apply that to the life we're living in. You know, We can't get up and do the same services, the same amount of prayers, the same fasting. However, we should have the same goal of transfiguring our lives by these things, and these should be joyful for us. So our efforts are about cleaning up the heart so that it's a place of purity, ready to receive grace. And when we receive grace, what do we want? We want the heart to become a new throne for Christ. This is really what we seek in the Christian life. There's, there's a great quote, and I believe it's by the great hierarch, Metropolitan Anthony Krapovitsky, but I could be wrong. Um, I haven't found it again. It's either him, it might be St. Ignatius Bronchana, if I can't remember, but essentially he's asked, he asks the question, what's the most ascetic book you'll ever read? And a lot of people said, The Latter Divine Descent by St. John Climatus. No, no, uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, ascetic little homilies. No, he says, no, it's the Bible. The Bible is the most ascetic book that you'll ever read. It calls, it has a very high calling for how we are to deny ourselves. Now, if you're listening to this right now or you're watching this online and you go, come on, this sounds like a really extreme thing. Like, I, I really think this is more for the monks. This isn't for the laymen. Come on, is this really the Christian calling for all of us? Does Christ really call? I, I, I think the gospel really just is calling us to faith. I don't think it is about any of this stuff. There's an article you should read. The article is by Father George Florovsky. F L O B O S K Y. Father George Florovsky. You can find it online. It's called The Ascetic Ideal and the New Testament. The Ascetic Ideal and the New Testament, and the subtitle is A Critique of the Theology of the Reformation. In this article, Father George Florovsky, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, goes through every single book of the New Testament and lists out all the, ver all the uh, verses that call us to asceticism. It is a powerful article, and you read that, and you realize, how could I ever think otherwise? But we read the scriptures based on our preconceived notions and the theology we already have. That's like our glasses, right? If I'm, if I'm a Reformed Christian, I'm going to put on the Reformed glasses and read the scriptures that way. If I'm a Catholic, I'm going to put on the Catholic glasses and read it that way. Orthodox Christianity, of course, believes that the saints are the ones who are filled with the same grace as the, gra as the, Holy Spirit, the, the grace of the Holy Spirit that wrote the scriptures in the first place. So we think that this is the proper interpretation. I think we have good reason for that. But the point is, is that you cannot escape asceticism if you read the scriptures properly. So that's a great article. I think everyone should. It's, it's lengthy, but it's well worth, worth your time. Okay, by the way, that I, I didn't mention that, uh, that verse, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and men of violence take it by force, Ma Matthew eleven twelve. 12, in case you're writing that down. So what does asceticism do? It causes us to constantly re-evaluate and examine our life in the world. Are we living more as citizens of heaven or more as citizens of earth? Are we becoming more heavenly with time? More angelic, more spiritual, or more earthly, more material, more worldly? Do we seek spiritual joys and comforts or more worldly pleasures and entertainments? It's important to see in this that there's an interplay happening between pleasure and pain. This is really the heart of what's happening here. As I said, the devil tempts us with worldly pleasures and comforts. And these addict us, right? They enslave us. If these things really fulfilled us, we wouldn't need more and more and more and more and more of them. And you can get addicted to just, not just drugs and alcohol, but about anything. You know, it seemed like when I was in, in middle school and high school, everyone, probably including myself, we were addicted to music. It meant that we bought the latest album, and when it came out, we listened to it until we were sick of it. And then we needed more, and we went and bought the next one. They got a lot of my money. Man, like ridiculous. And then eventually one day, I went, this is dumb, and I took all my CDs and threw them out. My mom went, that's a lot of money. And I said, yeah, but that's a lot of addiction. I mean, that's like, it wasn't good for me. It really wasn't good for me. 
these, these worldly things, you know, why, why do they become addictions? Because they disappoint us. You think, well, if it disappoints you, why would it become an addiction? Because that initial high you get from it, you want again. You buy the new technology. Oh, it felt so great at first. Oh, now my phone is a year old and they came out with a new model. It's not so exciting anymore, right? Oh, that donut tasted really good until I ate five more and then I felt sick. You know, but tomorrow I'm going to want more of it because it was so good. Everything we do, it feels really great at first and it seems like it'll fulfill us for a moment. But after that initial pleasure, we feel empty again. And in fact, we feel even more broken and more fallen. So we go for more and then it disappoints us again. And this is the constant lie of the devil and the lie of the passions. Just fulfill this passion a little bit more and you'll feel really great. Oh my gosh, I don't feel so great anymore. Just become a little bit more famous and then you'll be happy. Oh, I'm actually more miserable. Just do this a little bit more. Do that a little bit more. Constantly disappointed. Constantly feeling more broken and more divided. These things cannot fulfill the deeper longings of man for eter eternal joy, eternal peace, eternal warmth, eternal mercy, eternal love, etc., etc., etc. So what does the devil do? It says He says, oh, well, don't follow that path. That path is going to be boring. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to say no to yourself. You don't want to do that. So maybe you just didn't get enough of what I offered you. Or maybe you just need a little different variety. Maybe you just need a little bit of a different type. And we go, and we go to more and more earthly pleasure and more and more discontent. And our world has learned to rely on this so much so that when you have enough discontent build up, what happens? Despair. And this is, this is, this is the answer of why we see so much despair all around us. We have, as St. Augustine says, a God-shaped hole in our heart. And we're trying to fill it with everything but God. That was St. Augustine, I think, right? St. Augustine? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, with asceticism, what do we do? We take those initial impulses and we say, no, we deny it. We say, I know you're a thief of eternal joy, peace, and goodness, and beauty. I know you're a liar. I'm going to say no to you. Now, with the passions, there's initial pleasure, and then it leads to pain and despair. But fighting the passions with asceticism, there's an initial pain. So I have to stand through long prayers. I have to sleep less. I have to deny myself the food that I want. I can't just go sleep around. No more pornography. No more this. No more that. For me, it's like, no more apple fritters. Come on. <laughs> it's painful at first. But when we say no to those initial impulses, we're also saying no to coddling the body and to massaging the ego. And we scoop out some dirt. And as I said, some of that dirt is impacted in, and that's when it's scooping it out isn't going to do it. You've got to take the jackhammer. And it's going to be painful, but... When we weaken our slavery to those things, we find that our, heart, our, our uh, deeper heart no longer needs those things to feel fulfilled in the first place. And instead, we find that those spiritual joys, although harder to get, they're harder to achieve, they're harder to gain. When we do gain them, they fill us far more. And life is way more beautiful. From earthly discomfort comes eternal fulfillment. You cannot find the life of a saint who has went down, gone down this path and has not been a model of pure joy and peace and beauty and love and humility and mercy. You meet someone who's gone down this path who has done nothing but said no to those desires all their life, and yet they're so full of joy. And you want to be, and you could, just being around them, the grace radiates from them, and you just go, I feel like a, a, a person for the first time in my life. I feel full. It makes you want it. Just trust me on this. If you haven't experienced this yet, I hope someday you will. And forgive me that I'm not the one to give you that, that experience. Every priest should be. It's a shame and it's a scandal, but I'm not. But I'll tell you, I've met those who are, and it's life-changing. It is absolutely life-changing. So what does Christian asceticism then really mean? It means that becoming Orthodox is not a simple change of address on Sundays. We can't just change our address and leave it at that just come here and expect that the rest of our lives can remain the same. So much of Christianity today is about being more comfortable in the world and just simply wrapping it in Christian language. We embrace an ascetic ideal that is a daily struggle. And yes, it's a tough one. But we know that Christ isn't a masochist. He gives us his path because there's something so much better in store for us. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. This was true in Christ's life and it's true in our life as well. So, 
What are these earthly, deceptive allurements all about? They each feed the weeds of our soul. Okay, so our soul is kind of like a garden. There's flowers, beautiful and fragrant. These are the virtues, and there's weeds. These are the passions. And when we feed the passions, the weeds grow deeper roots, and they take up anything we try to feed to them, and the flowers begin to wither. And as those roots grow deeper, they become an essential part of our heart. We don't know how to live without them. We, we start to identify with them. This is what we call a passion. So remember we talked about this in the second week, that you begin to sin, and as you sin more and more, it becomes a habit. As it becomes a habit, those roots grow deeper, and suddenly now it's, it's almost impossible to take it from our heart. That's what a passion is. A passion is a sin that has deep, deep roots. So I mentioned that, that smaller book by St. John Cashin, The Institutes. In The Institutes, he goes over what are the eight main passions. Now, these are very related to, there's just a slightly different list in the West that you get from Dante, The Seven Deadly Sins. It's very similar. He just looks at it a slightly different way. And of course you can. You sort of like complex things. Like you have to be a scientist of the soul to, to really understand these. But the eight that he lists are these. And this is the main list that most Orthodox fathers after him would use. Number one is gluttony. Gluttony is not just overeating. It's a, it's a love for food. A, a disordered love for food. Not appreciation to God for our food, but a disordered love where our focus is on the food rather than on God. Number two is lust. Number three is avarice, or what we often call greed. Number four is anger. Number five, uh, sometimes it's just simply translated as, as sadness. Okay? And number six is akidia, or acedia, often called despondency. And that's, that's a pretty complex one. Uh, there's a, um, there's a, a good book called Time and Despondency that goes over what that really is, uh, that I recommend. Number seven is vainglory when you like other people to recognize you and think you're great. And number eight is pride, which is actually a little different than vainglory. Okay. Now, it's, it's very common to talk about getting rid of the passions, but our goal isn't really to get rid of the passions because the passions are not things in and of themselves. If we really understand the passions, we understand that what they are are distortions of the virtues. That's really what, what the passions are. So we want to transform our passions and, put, and make them virtues again. So the best way to fight with the passions is to forcefully practice the corresponding virtue. So if you find that gluttony is a big part of your life, the best way to fight it is through fasting. If you find that lust is a big part of your life, the best way to fight that is through abstinence. If you find that anger is constantly plaguing you, we fight it with meekness. We fight pride with actions and thoughts of humility. But of course, the ascetic life is a science. Like I said, it's the art of arts and science of sciences. This is really what prayer is and what asceticism is. Many, many thousands of pages are spent in the saints explaining each of the passions and the way to battle them. Many, many thousands of pages. Again, I'm going to keep giving you recommendations. If it's not on the catechumen book list, you don't have to read these. But if you want to go deeper, these are the ones I would recommend. So I'll recommend you a three-volume set on this. If you really want to get deep into what the passions are, where they come from, and how you fight against them. There's a three-volume set called The Therapy of Spiritual Illnesses, or The Therapy of Spiritual Illness. Um, it's from Alexander Press, which I believe is a Canadian press, so it can be hard to find, um, but you will be able to find it. The author of it is a great theologian, a French theologian, Jean-Claude Larchet, L-A-R-C-H-E-T. He's a really, really incredible man. He's a lay theologian. He's a physician by trade, but he's also like the greatest living expert on St. Maximus the Confessor, and he's written a lot of wonderful things, and everything he takes directly from the Fathers. And so this three-volume uh, set is, is like the standard work. It was just published maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Um, but it's the standard work if you want to just get in, in deep on what the passions are, where they come from, uh, how they kind of mess with our psychology, and how we fight against them. It's a very you know, aesthetically driven book. There's, um, there's one other book that I'd mention. And the, the book is The Spiritual Life and How to Be Attuned to It by St. Theophon the Recluse. We have this book in our bookstore. Um, the book is a series of letters uh, from St. Theophon, who's a relatively modern saint from Russia. A series of letters to his spiritual daughter. Now, the first 13 chapters, he goes over the makeup of the soul. And in going over the makeup of the soul, he talks about 
uh, the ways of life we can live and how uh, the different aspects of the soul. He divides the soul into three parts, <laughs> straight from philosophy. And he talks about what it looks like in a fallen state and what it looks like in the natural or the sanctified state. Okay, These first 13 chapters, you just have to get through. They can be really confusing because he doesn't do it in the most systematic of ways. He, he kind of jumps around. But if you want to read this, in order to help you, years ago, I think about, oh man, it was like probably my first or second year of priesthood, so uh, nearly 10 years ago, I, I wrote up a, um, a sheet that kind of uh, covers what the first 13 chapters are all about and kind of systematizes them. You can find this sheet uh, on our website. So if you go to uh, the catechumen tab, um, you can find uh, somewhere there. I don't know exactly where. You can find that sheet uploaded as a PDF. Um, I know I'm doing this on YouTube, so I have to be kind of strange about this and hold this up, but I'm not going to hold it up for long. This is what it looks like. Take a screenshot if you want. Um, and again, I'll, I'll try to link this on the comments for the uh, catechumen lecture. Um, but this goes over. It goes over there's three ways of life. There's a spiritual life. This is the highest life, the intellectual life, and the sensual life. It talks about the soul, how the highest part is the intellect, the nous. The active part is the will, or the sen and then there's, there's the sensual or desirous part. And he talks about what each of these look like in the fallen state, in the sanctified state. And then I give kind of a summary of what his basic points are in this. Okay? So if you're going to read it, I would recommend reading it with this as a bookmark so you have a reference point so you know exactly what he's talking about. Um, I, again, I did this in my first parish and we were doing it in the reading group and people found it quite helpful. I have never actually gone back to reread it and see if I did a good job on this or not. Uh, but I've given it to people in the parish who read it and said, yes, this, this was a good explanation. So hopefully it is. Um, I, I meant to print these out. I'll print out some next week so you can have a copy for yourself. Um, again, not on the um, reading list, but it's, it's a good one to read um, sometime in, in the first few years of being Orthodox. Uh, St. Theophon is a great guide, by the way, who takes a lot of the wisdom from the ancient fathers and just says, how can I distill, the, distill this and make this very understandable for people of today? Okay, and that was a couple hundred years ago in Russia, so it's, we're still a little bit removed from it, but it's, his writings are very helpful. So, depending on, on what uh, particular passion you're struggling with, its nature and how it manifests, how often you struggle with it, how long you've been struggling with it, and your personality, medicine for that will be applied differently. Okay? This is why we don't just take one simple book on each passion and say, well, this is going to fix everything for everyone, because you have to apply it differently for each person. Now, the main therapeutic works given by Christ through the church that we take to prepare ourselves for the medicine of grace, these are like the diet and exercise that are basically good for everybody. For everybody, good diet, good exercise, all these things are good. But even these medicines have to be adjusted accordingly for each person, okay? So what are the main medicines of the church that are good for everyone, but still may need a little adjustment? Well, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and prostrations. Those four things are basically good for anybody, okay? Now, not all, all of them may be perfectly suited for everyone, and they're going to be suited in different ways. I'm not going to give the same prayer rule to every single person here. If I did that, my job would be way easier and I have a lot more time, but it wouldn't be good for you. Because you'd say, well, this isn't working for me. And I'd say, well, that's what everyone's doing, so just do it. No, it doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone gets up at the same time. Not everyone works the same amount of hours. Not everyone has kids. Not everyone who does have kids has the same amount of kids. Like, there's a lot of different things to go in. Not everyone is the same age. Not everyone has been doing this as long as everybody else. So we need to kind of work these things in. But I want to give a word about each of these really quickly. Um, I think we're doing, we're doing okay on time, actually. Okay, so prayer. Prayer is not just conversation with God. I would love to do a separate talk all about this. I'm going to film some, um, record. There's no film anymore, so why do we say film? I'm going to record a couple of videos, uh, particularly on prayer and one particularly on fasting later on. That'll go into more depth with each of these things. But we talk a lot about prayer just being conversation with God. But although it is conversation with God, it, it, there's a lot more depth to it. It's a lot more complex, and it's actually not as simple as that, really. I mean, conversation, if I talk with you and you talk with me, I hear your voice, I hear direct instruction. If you constantly hear the voice of God booming out in your heads during prayer, well, we got to talk because that's not always a good thing. Sometimes that's actually a really negative thing. That may be a really negative thing. But beyond that, prayer is also struggle. Prayer is battle. Pick up your prayer rope and do the Jesus prayer. See how easily you keep your mind focused. You're going to notice it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. So how do we learn to pray? Well, again, everyone has 
similar medicine to begin with, but I would recommend is start with prayer books. Start with prayer books. Why is that important? Well, if I'm going to teach you some sort of martial arts, I'm going to teach you the proper form. You stand a certain way. You hold your hands a certain way. You punch a certain way. You kick a certain way. Have you ever seen someone fight like this? Like they get into a fight and they're like, I'm ready to fight. Come on. I'm gonna fight. No one fights like that. But, but the form is really important. Why is the form so important? Well, it's you know, just like the karate kid. By learning the proper form, you learn the proper movements, you learn the proper mindset. And then, then, when you spar with somebody, you can kind of improvise a little bit. But that foundation is really necessary. It's the same thing with these prayers. So people ask, well, can I pray in my own words? You can. However, the prayers of the church were written by people who weren't just praying by themselves. Rather, the Holy Spirit was praying within them. And so they were guided by the Holy Spirit, which is why you can read prayers from the 2nd or 3rd or 4th century and prayers from the 21st century that sound a lot alike because the same Spirit is illumining the, these, these figures. And so this is the language of the Holy Spirit, which we want to get used to. So the prayers may feel a little foreign at first. That's okay. Read those first, and then at the end, go ahead and pray in your own words. But you're going to notice in time, you're going to pray in your own words a lot less because you're going to feel like these words are becoming my words. These are expressing my heart's deepest longing, even without me realizing it. Okay? Especially with time, you're going to want to pray the Jesus prayer. Everyone should have a prayer rope. Uh, you should read the Way of a Pilgrim to begin uh, learning about the Jesus prayer. I like the short version, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Uh, but the long version is fine. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And what will happen is, is, if you haven't yet, eventually come talk to me and I'll give you a prayer rule, which is these are the prayers you want to be doing mornings. These are the prayers you want to be doing in the evenings. You can always add to it, but you want a basic uh, prayer rule to begin with. Now, as you grow in the faith, sometimes you're going to find that your heart is just really leaning more towards Psalms one day or towards Nakathis another day or towards the Paraclesis or towards this or towards that. And that's fine. But you want a, a rule that's your home base that you can always go back to. Okay? And eventually, you want to make sure you're moving from saying your prayers to praying your prayers. Big difference. Saying your prayers is me standing alone reading. Praying my prayers is me knowing that God is present and being humbled by his presence and being grateful for it and speaking to him and inviting him in constantly, constantly inviting him in. And eventually we want to move from having just a simple prayer rule to a life of prayer. A life of, it doesn't mean, I mean, obviously if we could pray every moment every day, like many of the saints could, that'd be great. But even if we can't do that, we want, we want to feel that prayer is life giving. It's not something we're adding to the day. No, this is where we actually get life from the day. And we want to yearn for prayer. I say it in almost every baptism. Don't just pray and fast, but learn to love prayer and to love fasting. That's a really great place to be. And the more you do it, the more you'll love it. The fathers say that prayer is one of the few places in life where quantity leads to quality. The more you pray, the better you'll pray. It's really an art. and It takes a lifetime to learn. Fasting. The Old Testament law specifically required prayer and fasting for the Day of Atonement. This custom became known as the day of fasting. You can see that in Jeremiah 36.6 or the fast, uh, Acts 27.9. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights when he was on Mount Sinai to receive the law of God from Exodus 34.28. King Jehoshaphat called for a fast in all Israel when they were about to be attacked by the Moabites and Ammonites in 2 Chronicles 23. <coughs> in response to Jonah's pre preaching, the men of Nineveh, Fasted and put on sackcloth, Jonah 3.5. Prayer and fasting was often done in times of distress and trouble. David fasted when he learned that Saul and jo Jonathan had been killed, 2 Samuel 1, 12. Nehemiah had a time of prayer and fasting upon learning that Jerusalem was still in ruins, Nehemiah 1.4. Darius, the king of Persia, fasted all night after he was forced to put Daniel in the den of lions, Daniel 6.18. Prayer and fasting also occurs in the New Testament. Anna worshipped night and day, fasting and praying at the temple, Luke 2.37. John the Baptist taught his disciples to fast, Mark 2.18. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before his temptation by uh, Satan in, in the desert, Matthew 4.2. The church of Antioch fasted in Acts 3.2 and sent Paul and Barnabas off on their first missionary journey, Acts 13.3. 13, Paul and Barnabas spent time in prayer and fasting for the appointment of elders in the church, Acts 
So again and again and again, we see that fasting is just a normal part of the Christian life. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it was a normal part. But a lot of people don't really understand what fasting is about. Again, I want to do a separate video just on this topic because it's important and we really don't understand it. But a very, very general idea of what fasting is about. There's a proper ordering to man, and there's an improper or a, a fallen order to man. The fallen order to man is how most people live. What happens is, is the desires of the body come first, the needs of the soul come second, and any consideration for God goes third if it goes at all. Is this how a lot of people live today? All over the place we see this. We see this all over the place. Fasting helps turn this into a proper order. We say God has given the order to fast. Christ assumed that we were going to fast. He said after he would leave, then they will fast. His assumption was Christians will fast. God is first, the care of the soul is second, and the body gets third. Okay? Fasting is also an aid to prayer. When we fast, and you see this throughout the scriptures, that fasting and prayer often go together. When we fast, we're saying no to the body, and we're, we're lifting up the soul. And the soul, in prayer, is not weighed down. This is why there are certain foods that we fast from. We fast from meat and dairy, but not from shellfish. And people go, well, I can have crab, but I can't have a burger. Why? Well, because when you eat crab, you don't feel weighed down and sluggish and like you want to fall asleep. But when you have a, like a double cheeseburger, uh, I want to take a nap. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> this is just how we are. So we feel the body kind of lightened here. And we're, again, it's about saying no to the body to a certain extent. But not because we're anti-body, but because we want to place the body in the proper place. The body should serve the soul, and the soul should, should serve God. We don't want the body calling the shots all the time. Okay, almsgiving. We should give alms wisely, but without suspicion. Wisely meaning that if we know that somebody is trying to scam us, or we know more so in the world that we live in, um, this means that if you, get a, uh, <laughs> if you get an email from Nigeria from the prince asking for money, you don't need to send them money to be a good Christian. Um, I would recommend not doing that. Uh, so <laughs> I know him. He's emailed me many times, and we're very close, and uh, he doesn't need money. Um, it also means that if you know somebody is strung out on drugs outside of our church or an alcoholic, giving them money probably isn't the best thing to do. You can give them some food. Even then, it can be a little iffy because sometimes they sell the food for money in order to buy more drugs. And so you've got to be a little bit wise about it, but don't be suspicious. Don't Every time someone asks you for money, don't assume. If you don't know, out of Christian love, pray for them. But more so, you know, as Christians, sometimes we do almsgiving like this. There's a homeless person. They say, oh, can I have some change? You go, no, fine, here you go. And we walk on. I, I haven't treated that person like a person at all. Well, you know, a better thing to do would be to say, what's your name? How'd you end up on the street? You can get to know them a little bit and find out if giving them money in the first place is going to help them, but show them a little love. I can tell you, having done this now for years at this parish, showing a little love goes a lot further than giving a couple dollars. And you can do both. Okay? Um, in this parish, just, just so you're, uh, you're uh, aware, um, if, if people come in and start asking for money, it's a good thing just to check with me first because I know a lot of the people who do ask for money. There's some people who you can give to and some people I would say mm, it's actually not a good thing to give them money. Okay, so just watch out. Um, part of that almsgiving is also tithing. It's a normal thing to tithe in the church. This is not something I ever look at. I never look at wh who's giving what. I don't care. It doesn't make a difference to me. However, we should do this out of the goodness of our heart. Now, the ideal, they say, is, is 10%, but really, that was the Old Testament ideal. The reason that we kind of are, are a little bit cautious about using that language here is because out of the goodness of the Christian heart, we give whatever we can. So sometimes 10% is nothing for someone, and sometimes it's way too much for another person. So again, it's like any other medicine. It needs to be adjusted from person to person. But we don't want to be leeches on the church. You don't want to come and get all the good things of the church and never give. We need to support the ministries, and we need to support the parish and what it's doing, and the church as a whole. Okay, And so we should all be tithing. Finally, prostrations. There's a, a difference between bows and prostrations. You'll see this in the language of the prayer books. A bow is a, is a move, from just a, a bend from the waist. You'll see people bend all the way down and touch the ground, do the sign of the cross. A prostration is when you go all the way down, touch your forehead to the ground, and get back up. People say, that looks Muslim. And I go, yeah, they got it from us. <laughs> That's where Islam grew. It, it grew in a place where Christian, Christianity had already spread. So they saw the Christians doing it and started doing it too. And it's kind of our thing. Um, it's good to have some prostrations as part of your prayer rule. I recommend that people start with just 12 a day. Um, why are prostrations a good thing? Well, we know they're a good thing because the saints tell us so. They tell us that this is, it's an immensely helpful thing to do prostrations in the spiritual life and to do bows. Why? Because 
Prayer is not, we're body and soul. We want to pray in body and soul. Also, there's nothing more humbling than laying yourself flat out on the ground with your forehead down before Christ and realizing how unworthy we are to lift our head before him. It's actually really humbling for us. Now, there's one time when we don't do prostrations, one day a week. That day is Sunday. On Sunday, we don't kneel or do prostrations because Sunday is the day of resurrection. So we stand in the glory of the resurrection. There are exceptions to this every now and then. Um, the main exception is whenever we have a major feast of the cross. When we have a major feast of the cross on a Sunday, we'll kneel before the cross, just for the cross. But otherwise, we, we don't kneel, we don't do prostrations on Sundays because that's a penitential position. Okay. All right, so these are the main things that, that prep us and, and kind of cover the entire soul. And through these practices, we may not be battling all our specific passions, but we help soften the heart. The, that, remember we talked about the heart like a garden? We, we soften the soil so that it becomes more receptive to spe specific medicines, and we can pluck out those, those uh, weeds a little bit more easily. Okay? Now again, with really deep roots, it takes many, many years of doing this. And this is why what happens is in baptism, seeds of grace are planted. You're not going to have all the virtues just come to you like this, but seeds of grace, we need to water those, and we water those also through these actions, okay? So all of this helps us to receive grace so as to be transformed, and this is what we call active repentance. Remember how I said the whole Christian life is all centered on repentance? These are the main tools of repentance. Now, recall that repentance is turning towards full communion with Christ. It's always turning back to Christ in everything we do. Remember what we said, our hearts are divided. Our heart says, I want to turn to Christ, but I also want to turn to that apple fritter. Apple fritters are really good. I don't know if you've ever had one. <laughs> if you get a good one. I want to do both. I want to turn towards Christ, but I really want to turn towards my pillow. I love my sleep. I want to turn towards Christ, but, you know, oh, I, just, I, I love booze. I love, you know, I love scotch, but I have like one glass a week, so don't worry. <laughs> We shouldn't even say the love. I really enjoy and appreciate it. The, the, the reality is, is our heart is constantly divided. And this is why we don't just dedicate ourselves fully to Christ right off the bat. We have to start slowly. We have to start slowly and we have to start with guidance so that we're not going too slow or too quick, which is why we have a spiritual father. It has nothing to do with me wanting to control you. Me, I don't want to control. I can barely control my own life. I can't really even control my own household. You've seen my kids. <laughs> I can't do it. I don't want to control you, but I want to take the experience that I have or the knowledge that I have from years and years and years of reading the saints, their lives and writings, and help guide you in this. Okay? But within this, don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake that's saying, wow, you know, everything he's telling me is be against the world. So against my body being in control. This is really anti-material. It's anti-world. It's anti-body. No, not at all. Not at all. This is about falling out of love with the world and ourselves, which again, always give us false promises. They're always deceptive. They always disappoint us. It's not about hating those things. It's just about not loving them and placing that love where it's actually due to Christ. That's what it's about. And in fact, it's really pro-material world. Asceticism is the most pro-world thing you can do. Why? Because we order the world again within us properly. God, soul, body and the material world to serve everything, to serve us. And when we do that, we bring things back to their true purpose and to true communion with, with God. You can prove this in the church. Why is orthodoxy the most pro-body and pro-material faith there is? Because we have things like holy relics. When a saint dies, their bodies sometimes don't decompose, and even if they do, their bones, myrrh will stream out of them, a fragrant oil, They'll be fragrant. They'll work miracles. And when you have a sanctified person, animals and nature around them, plants, will recognize that holiness and return to their paradisical state. I, I've mentioned before about um, St. Seraphim of Sarov who had the bear that would come to him. And I think I mentioned that uh, my, my wife's grandmother, uh, who uh, just reposed, uh, Maria, uh, she met Elder Cleopa. I've read the life of Elder Cleopa in English. It's a beautiful life. Really, really great life. It doesn't mention this in there, though. I know this only because he told her that when he was hiding from the communists out in the wilderness, living in the mountains, he also had a bear. And he said every day he would pick two potatoes. He'd save one for himself and one for the bear. And the bear would come and eat out of his hand. This is how we should be with wild animals. They shouldn't be wild. But until they recognize grace within us, 
they don't know what to do. They're fragmented and distorted too. So this is very pro-world. It's about bringing the world back in contact with grace and transfiguring it. And the entire Orthodox life is a life of repentance. Or more simply, it's a life in accordance with, or maybe better, uh, simply a way of saying this, it's really about following the commandments of Christ. Orthodox asceticism and repentance, everything we just talked about, is simply about living a life following the commandments of Christ. Now, when I say this, what are the commandments of Christ? There's the Ten Commandments given to Moses, and then there's the commandments of Christ. The Ten Commandments are a representative of the entirety of the Mosaic Law. Okay, There's 613 laws in all, but they're really centered on these Ten Commandments. The commandments of Christ are represented by and centered on what? The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are what really bring us to the fullness of the gospel and what gospel living is about. So, as we seek to live out these Beatitudes, the one thing we have to realize is, as I've told you many times, you're not going to be very good at this. (laughs) That scooping out the dirt... Well, that dirt's been in there a long time and you've been really used to pouring more dirt in or just leaving it and being comfortable with it. So it takes a long time to learn to get get rid of this. So it can be really tough at first. But I want you to remember this passage from Matthew 22, uh, verses 35 to 40. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is really what everything is about. Everything in the faith, all that we're doing is teaching us. I can't love the Lord and love myself at the same time. Because I choose myself over God constantly. We all do. So what I need to do is fall out of love with the world and with myself and learn to say no to myself so I can love Christ better and again, place him in my heart instead of that old man. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's that same glass analogy just in St. Paul's words, better words. (laughs) It's no longer I who live. The ego has been scooped out, but Christ lives in me. Christ has been put put there in his place. Then there's, there's Matthew 5, 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. What? He didn't really mean this. I've, I've heard commentaries like this, by the way, on Protestant radio. Like, well, he didn't really mean this. Oh, he meant it. He meant it. But the, what, the only way to be perfect is to have he who is perfect live inside of you. There's certain sins that we may involuntarily commit no matter what in this life. We can't avoid. But at least we're seeking that perfection which will be given in heaven. And how do we seek it? By trying to live it here and now. All of life, all of life is worship. Remember when we talked about worship? Worship is seeking to become like the object of your worship. Everybody's worshiping something. Everybody's moving towards something they want to become. We are worshiping he who is perfect, Christ. We want to become like Christ. And we know we can't do it without him, so we have to work our efforts to have him come dwell inside of us. His efforts. Synergy. The two work together. It's a slow process. It's not going to happen all at once. If it did happen all at once, we would not appreciate it. We would throw it out really quickly. Anything in life that's worthwhile is hard to obtain. And Christ is tough to obtain because we have a lot of impact and dirt and junk inside of that heart. So, what should you do? Pastorally, I recommend that you have expectations of only two things. Don't expect you're going to be great at this. That's, That's a sure way to fall into despondency. Expect only two things. Number one, I will fall. I will fall. I'm not going to be good at this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up in the morning. I'm going to say, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to follow Christ really well, and I'm going to be really great. No, don't say that. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to struggle well, but I know. I know I'm weak. I'm prideful. I will fall. And expectation number two, when I do, if I repent, Christ will pick me back up again. These are the only two expectations you can have in a spiritual life. I will fall. When I do, I will repent and Christ will pick me back up again. This is what, so when someone asks St. Siloan the Athenite, what do you monks do all day? He thought for a second, he said, we fall and get back up again. 
That's it. That's the whole of the Christian life. You're going to fall and get back up again. And Christ could make it so that you never fall, but then what's going to happen? You're going to get really prideful and think, I'm really great at this. And that pours more dirt in rather than water. So he has to teach you some humility. And he teaches that by going, you're relying on yourself. Good luck. Oh, you fell again. Okay, I'll pick you back up again. Oh, you want to rely a little bit on yourself? Okay, oh, you fell. Okay, I'll pick you back up again. And what happens is at first we say, well, I want to rely like, 10% 10% on you, 90% on me. Oh, you're going to fall and hard, fall hard. Okay, after a few years, I'm going to go, okay, 20% you, 80% me, and I'll fall really hard. And eventually you go like, uh, 99% you and 1% me. And he goes, good, good luck, and you fall again. But the saints are the ones who say, no, it's, it's not about me at all. It's really, really not about me at all. I can do nothing. And this is the greatest prayer, by the way. Don't fall into despondency like I keep telling you. Don't fall into despondency. The greatest prayer you can pray is the one where you say, I have nothing left to fight with except my voice crying out to Christ. All I have left is my voice. But first you have to get yourself to that point of weakness. How do you do that? Asceticism. Asceticism will help you get to that point of weakness. What does Christ say about weakness? What did he say to St. Paul? My strength is perfected in weakness. If we want Christ to be strong in us, we have to learn to be weak in the right way. It doesn't mean being wusses. It doesn't mean being scared. It means being tough, being violent, until we've beaten back the ego and we're exhausted. And we say, I have nothing left. And Christ picks us up. The driving force of this, remember, is that theme, what's that golden thread going through all these lectures? Relationship. Which means do not live. I really want to emphasize this. Please listen to this. Do not live the spiritual life as a simple checking off of boxes. That cannot be your spiritual life. I want to make sure I say my prayers. I want to make sure I read scriptures. I want to make sure I just check off all my boxes and then I'm good. Because your heart's not in that. You have left it at this dry, dead list. And you're going to find that filling that list every day becomes exhausting. And so what happens? Life is already a burden. And the spiritual life is an additional burden on top of that. I already had so much to do. I already have so much going on. And now I have to say my prayers too, and I'm exhausted. I have to fast too, and I'm exhausted. No. The spiritual life should be a refuge from the burden of life. And if you're doing it right, not checking off the boxes, you're going to find that it's that refuge and that you love it. And the only way to keep it from being a, a, a process of checking off boxes is that the driving force must be love. Love Christ. Want more Christ. Seek more Christ. Yearn for Christ. If this is the driving force of your spiritual life, it won't be a burden for you. It'll be a refuge from burden. And sometimes it'll be tough. But even in that toughness, you can find ways to unload your burden. You know, sometimes when, when the spiritual life becomes really dry, and it does become dry at times. It's tough. We can look at that and say, I, I, I want to want Christ. I want to try to love Christ. But like everything is just so boring and long. And, or we can say, oh man, it's tough. It's tough. This is going to really help me scoop out some dirt. Some of that dirt that's really impacted in. Now I'm going to get really tough. I'm going to live asceticism. Or we can say even better. We can say, boy, the spiritual life got really dry. My zeal is really weak. I really didn't love Christ. And I keep begging for him to, t- to give me that zeal again, but it's not happening. Maybe I sorrowed him in some way and didn't... Re- Maybe I need to really recognize this. Maybe I need to examine myself more closely and see how I'm not living the life I should be living. And maybe I need to cry out to him with more weakness and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm, I'm going to stop trying and just beg you. I'm just going to kneel here and pray the Jesus prayer until you give me strength again because I have nothing left. Whew, humble prayer. And he, he, he'll answer it. He will answer it. The reality is, is our, our spiritual life shouldn't be driven by this desire to check off boxes, but rather a desire... To love God, which means not to sorrow our Lord. We don't want to sorrow Christ. We just want to be with him. We just want to be with him. And so this should be the driving force that drives our asceticism. I don't want to sorrow our Lord. I want to live a life pleasing to him. Not because I think that my works are going to somehow earn my salvation. That's not it. But because I know I've sorrowed him so much in life already. I want to show him how much I love him. I know he's going to forgive me no matter what. But as long as I call out to him. But I want to show him how much I desire that forgiveness and how much I appreciate it with the life that I live. This is asceticism well lived and this is asceticism that won't burn you out but will actually be life-giving for you. And this is what we really want, a life-giving asceticism. So this was the talk on our efforts towards God. Next week we'll talk about the efforts of God towards us and how 
grace is given to us in the life of the church and in the spiritual life. Okay, this leaves us about 10 minutes for questions. So we did pretty well. So questions. Yes. I guess sometimes, I, I guess here's the situation. If you have some grief for somebody who you know will probably just get irresponsible and tell it and buy drugs, um, but I guess my assumption is, is that they would probably sell that food at a markdown and they would probably sell it to somebody who is in a similar situation to themselves. Um, so it's almost this, per this other person is getting this resource mm -hmm. at a markdown price that would be helpful to them, but at the same time, it's enabling somebody else to do something that's going to hurt themselves to take this risk. This is the capitalist approach to almsgiving. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, how would you approach that? If there's somebody that's food, is it like... You know, every, every situation is going to be different. It's, uh, the, so the question is about how do we approach these like difficult situations where someone may be asking for food that they may sell, but the person they're selling it to may, may actually need it more. And I mean, how do we really, how do we wade through this? This is just the nature of, I mean, we live in such a fallen world. And so... St. John of Kronstadt is a great, great uh, 19th century priest in Russia, great wonder worker. He clairvoyantly knew who was asking for legitimate reasons and who wasn't. And he'd look at some people and say, don't give to that person. They're trying to scam you, you know, but he'd give to other people in abundance. He often would be handed an envelope full of money and he wouldn't even look at it and he'd give it to somebody and the exact amount that they needed was in that envelope. It just happened all the time with him. Well, we need to recognize we're not there. We're not there. And so really we have to ask the simple question, can I give to this person uh, with with love and and uh, and prayer and hope that this is going to somehow be to his or to someone else's benefit? And if we can, I think maybe just leave it at that and hope that Christ honors that. Um, because it really does, it gets very, very complex quickly. But this is why actually having a conversation is helpful. And I've, I've done this, you know, every now and then. Doesn't it? I don't do this enough to my shame, but every now and then what I'll do is I'll actually bring somebody food and then sit down with them and, and eat with them um, and talk with them. Um, you'll have some interesting conversations. <laughs> My favorite conversation, I shouldn't laugh at this, but it was funny. I mean, but I feel bad. The guy clearly had some, uh, uh, suffering from schizophrenia, but uh, I had one guy in the back where I, I told him, I said, ah, I'm sorry, sir, but you know, we don't let people hang out back here in the park. We've had too many problems with crime and break-ins and different things. He goes, oh, don't worry about it. So I said, well, what's your name? You know, how'd you end up on the street? And so he told me his name and he started he started talking and he goes, well, you know, that's, it's just like the common story. He goes, I used to, I used to have a home, a wife, you know, a family. Um, I had a great job. Everything was going really well. And he goes, it's just, it's, it's probably a story you've heard a thousand times. And I thought, oh, he fell into drugs. He goes, it's, it's a story you've heard a thousand times. Time travel entered the equation and then everything just fell apart. And I went, oh, okay, whoa, okay. <laughs> Back to the future. Uh, now, but that guy, well, was he seeking a bunch of drugs? No, I mean, I could actually, by getting to know him, I could see, okay, this is a case of mental illness. And so I was able to actually give him some food, some money, and know that he was going to use it to the best of his ability. And then there were other guys. We, we've got one guy who comes every few months, he comes back, and every time he comes and he tells me, oh, I'm totally clean now, and then he hides drugs in our garden. Um, you know, and I've, I've just learned, like, we can't let him in the church because he causes issues, and I, I never give him money, you know, but... I know him well enough that I can be tough with him. And I'll look him straight in the eye and I'll say, I'll give you a little food, but you, you better eat this. I don't want you selling this to somebody. Every situation is different. And when you don't know, you just have to do the best you can. What would love look like in this situation? I'll do the best I can and leave it at that. So I wish I could give you a simple equation, and simple answer for this, but the reality is, is all we can do is just test, you know, what's the motivation for our heart and hope that it's going the best way. But main thing, if you can't get their name, write it down and make sure you're doing prayers for them every night. I have a list, an ongoing list of, of homeless people I've had in, encounters with that I continue to pray for. And I'll tell you, some of them, hugely impressive when it comes to prayer. Like, they excitedly receive help and ask for your name and the name of your church and they want to pray for you. And it doesn't happen often, but what it does, it's inspiring. Really inspiring. That's when you go, homeless or full for Christ? I don't know. But I've met some people that I think are really holy. Okay. No other questions for that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this was like a heavy one. This, there's a lot to this.
Great question. Okay. Okay. So the question is, is how do we distinguish what orthodoxy says about being a citizen of heaven, not so much of this earth from what the Gnostics said, where they said all spiritual things and immaterial things are good, material things are bad. And like I said, this is actually a very pro-world approach. But one of the distinctions that we have to make, and again, I, I don't have it in here, maybe I should for next year, is that when we say the world, we can mean two different things. And the scriptures mean two different things by the world. You see when St. Paul talks about the world. Sometimes he's talking about the physical world around us, which we're not against. And sometimes he's talking about the world in the sense of fallenness and sin, which is so an influence in things around us. That's the world that we're fighting against. The Gnostics had the sense that the material world was negative. We don't think so at all. We think that the reason the material world is so full of natural disasters and you know poisons and thorns and animals that eat us and all this other stuff is because of the world of sin. Same with the flesh. When we talk about the flesh, we have to fight against the flesh. You know, it's, it's fighting against the flesh controlling me, the passions within me that want to control me. I actually want my flesh to be sanctified. That's what I really want. I want, I want to create holy relics. That's why uh, Father John Romanidis, another great 20th century theologian, he says that his definition for the church is, the church is a relic factory. That's what the church should do is create holy relics. It's kind of a beautiful image. So this is the difference, is that we're not against the world at all. When we want to become citizens of heaven, by doing so, we're taking the material world around us, hopefully, and, and bringing sanctity to it so that it becomes what it was meant to be in the first place. Because all of creation will be transfigured in the age to come. All of, tra all, all of creation. All of creation was created good, as Genesis says. We know that God created it good. So that's what we're trying to do, is bring it back to its goodness by taking sin away from it and, and bringing virtue and grace back into it. And so what does that look like? Well, again, we have the lives of the saints to show us that the animals that are wild become tame. That plants will sometimes even bow in towards like saints like Saint Irene Chrysavalanto as she prays. Um, we have a lot of these cases, but it's not a, necessarily a permanent fixture because we still live in a fallen world. But these are signs of things to come. It's 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 like heaven reaching down and putting a fingerprint. It's like you know when you put a fingerprint on your own skin and it lasts for just a few seconds and then it kind of fades. This is what happens with the saints when they're in a place. It's sanctified for a while and it may fade over time. Um, there's a great story of uh, St. Porfirius, who reposed in 1991. It was one of my favorite saints. Incredible. And uh, he stayed at someone's house. He was in, in a city in Athens, and, uh, or near Athens. And he stayed at their house overnight. And the next night, they, they could hear like the most beautiful singing they'd ever heard in their lives. And they went and they were searching around the house. And they went to the guest room where he had stayed. And when they opened the door, that's where they heard angelic singing. What was happening? He was such a holy figure that just being in that room, it was sanctified and it became like heaven. And that remained for a day or two, you know, and they could hear the singing until it finally faded. And so this is kind of what happens in this world. But uh, when Christ comes, everything will be transfigured in the blink of an eye. And suddenly we don't have to worry about that corruption in the world anymore. Okay. All right. Yes. Mm hmm mentioned that we have not lost the name, that we have true names and fallen names. Uh, and to name something is to kind of like describe a role of the proximity to man versus God. Um, so I'm wondering about the use of words. And I was thinking about When, when God created the world, but before that, and so the, there was like these words to distinguish things from darkness, which is earthly. So I guess like my question is, is it, is it an okay idea to use like stillness and darkness and void when you approach that in a way? Closer to God, and get closer to God. Instead of... Whew. 
Okay, that's a really complex question. <laughs> um, and I, I, I think I want to go back to what, what I said about names. I, I, there may have, maybe I didn't explain it well, because I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I recognize my own words and what you said, um, which probably was my fault. And the only way for me to check is to check my notes on my phone, which is recording, so I can't do that. But this idea of, of like, okay, so th there is an idea in the church, this is like deep ascetic stuff about like divine darkness. This is a really, really complex uh, uh, idea. But um, the, the best place to look is um, St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote a book called The Life of Moses. And in The Life of Moses, he talks about entering a divine darkness where essentially because the knowledge of God is so beyond anything that we can compare it to, again, it's the uncreated versus all the created things around us, that all the things we thought we knew suddenly go dark. And now all there is is this, but it's not a void in the sense of their nothingness. It's rather, uh, there, there's, there's light within the darkness, um, but that that knowledge of God is so beyond anything that we've experienced that he describes it as this divine darkness. Again, that gets to a really, really complex uh, kind of ascetic ideal that I really don't feel qualified to talk about, honestly. Um, I'll let you know when I experience it. <laughs> so, uh, so never, um, <laughs> at least not in this life, uh, you know. But um, um, start with that. Start with St. Gregory of Nyssa and the, uh, the life of Moses. And I think that's uh, N-Y-S-S-A. St. Gregory of Nyssa. We do have it in the bookstore, I think. I know I ordered a bunch of copies. I'm not sure if we sold out or not, but I think it's down there. If it's not, it's easy to get. So, Okay. All right. On to Vespers or not. One more question. Yeah, Saint, the book St. Siloan the Athenite by St. Sophronia of Essex. That's also... Yeah. That one's a that's a big chunk to to take too, but uh, yeah, yeah. Rob, Robert will show you. So okay, all right. Jared. Oh, this is a good question. Okay, how how do you how do you work in how do you I guess divine darkness? How do you work in prostrations? Um, my recommendation is to have a certain set amount that you want to do. I recommend doing them in the morning at the end of your prayer roll. Why at the end? Because when I do that at the beginning, my prayer after that is, Lord, just get some mercy on me. Lord, just get some mercy on me. <laughs> and I'm just exhausted. So I typically do them at the end. And if I find that I'm doing more, like during Lent, I'll, do, I'll try to double my rule. I'll do half in the morning, half in the evening. Um, and I, that's, that's what I find best. But again, that's something you want to talk to a spiritual father about and kind of see, depending on where you are and how many you're doing. Some of the saints were doing like thousands every day. And that's beyond me, so... Yes. Um, where can we get the book of prayers? Okay, uh, we can get prayer rolls hopefully down in the bookstore. I think we still have some. Um, if we don't, I try to keep them on order. And then prayer books, we have some various ones, but we have one specifically for the parish that is just like the stuff you're going to do every day without all the excess, excess stuff. A lot of the extra stuff is great, but it confuses people at first. And so there's one called the parish prayer book. That's where I'd start. And then beyond that, the two that I recommend the most um, are the one, one's called the Jordanville Prayer Book, and one is called um, it's the Holy Transfiguration Monastery Prayer Book. Both of those are great, and then I think New Rome Press came out with one that is supposed to be really good. Um, but again, start with the Parish Prayer Book, and we can we can talk about that. So okay, all right, now we need to do Vespers. So may God bless and keep you. Thank you all very much.